Hey guys, so today we have another history major flaws and why it got cancelled video. This one is an important one because it's for the Dodge Charger, a car that began this whole channel. You might argue that the Charger is coming back in the future, but in its current form on the LX slash LD platform, it is being discontinued and it won't be the same again when it returns, so I wanted to give it the respect that it deserves with one of these episodes. If you're new to the series, this is where we look back at the history of the car and all the details and specs, and then we jump to talking about the events that led to the car being cancelled, and any flaws that it had. So let's get into this episode for the Dodge Charger. The LX Charger lived on for a long time. What was technically the 6th generation of the Charger was out from 2006 to 2010, and then the 7th gen LD was from 2011 to 2023, but it did get significant styling upgrades in 2015. So we're going to take a deeper look at the interior, exterior, different models, and performance, and then we'll talk about the cancellation. The Charger was developed to continue the Dodge Charger line with its muscle car heritage and replace the Dodge Intrepid as Dodge's full-size sedan. The last Charger had been the 1982-1987 version, essentially an Omni subcompact L-body vehicle. And before that, you have to go back to the 3rd gen in 1971 to find the last Hemi-powered Charger until it returned. Bringing it back started with the Charger RT concept, which would debut at the 1999 North American International Auto Show, representing daring change to the slew of mediocre American vehicles. The exterior took some styling cues from the 1968 Charger and also the Viper. It used some mechanical parts from the Viper, Intrepid, and Prowler, and it was built on a modified version of the Chrysler LH platform. It did have four doors, but it was hard to tell as they were blended in very smoothly. The interior was designed to give a feeling of a sophisticated fighter plane cockpit with black and red leather racing style bucket seats. The concept was interestingly powered by a supercharged compressed natural gas 4.7 liter V8 engine with 325 horsepower and was paired with a Borg Warner 5 speed manual transmission with rear wheel drive. If you didn't know, Chrysler Corporation had a history with compressed natural gas innovations. They were the first company to offer CNG vehicles in a variety of different classes of low emissions, but unfortunately no market ever emerged for it like Chrysler had hoped for, and today there are only 115,000 vehicles in the US that run on CNG. Had there not been the Daimler Chrysler merger, we could have seen a production version just like this concept. Chrysler had been working on a next generation of their LH platform, and they had plans to produce this car somewhere in the early to mid 2000s. But after the merger, the styling and engineering of the company went in a different direction, and the concept car was not put into production. The Dodge Charger would reach production, released for the 2006 model year, but it was the Chrysler LX platform, and that was very different from the concept in almost every way, aside from still having four doors. Speaking about the Chrysler LX platform, that's a very important part of the conversation of the Dodge Charger. Chrysler confirmed they sent their engineers to Germany to study the upcoming Mercedes-Benz E-Class at the time, allowed thanks to the merger between Daimler and Chrysler. Many components of this car come from the W211 Mercedes-Benz E-Class from 2003 to 2009, and the W220 S-Class as well. Those include a 3.0-liter turbo diesel V6 used in the 300 in Europe and Australia, the rear suspension cradle and 5-link independent rear suspension design from the E-Class, lower control arms from the E55 AMG, and a double wishbone front suspension designed from the S-Class. Other parts were directly pulled from Mercedes, like the 5-speed NAG1 transmission, rear differential, all-wheel drive transfer case components, drive shaft, ESP and ABS systems, steering system, seat frames, seat controls, and lots more. So now let's move on to the prices for the first gen. I'll go over a few various years, but there's too many to cover all of them. For 06 and 07, there was an unnamed base model, powered by either the 2.7 liter or 3.5 liter V6, and with your basic features. The SE Plus and SXT became trim levels in 2008, and both the SXT and RT models were available in all-wheel drive starting in 2007. Base prices were around 25000 while the more performance-oriented RT was in the low 30000s, and the top-of-the-line SRT8 under 40000 Unlike previous Chargers, this one had four doors, but Dodge tried to preserve a coupe-like look with a sloping rear roofline, steeply raked rear window, and a short deck lid. It doesn't overdo it with the body, keeping it simple. With the trademark Dodge grille and high belt line, even the base models look really aggressive. It rides on the LX platform, so it shares a 120-inch wheelbase with the Chrysler 300 and Dodge Magnum, and it's a huge sedan at just over 200 inches long. The SE Plus had 17-inch wheels, SXT optional 18-inch, 
and the RT had 20 inch wheels after 06, but otherwise the models look pretty similar. The SRT8 got chromed exhaust tips, a functional hood scoop, a different front fascia and air dam, and unique 20 inch SRT wheels to distinguish it from the rest. And 2009 and 2010 models changed the deck lid badging and the tail light design. Moving inside, for the first few years the interiors lived up to Chrysler's reputation of using really cheap materials and having poor fit and finish. The design and control layout was always functional at least. 2008 and up models got an improvement with more soft touch materials, no visible edges or parting lines, and less plastics. The steering wheel was a four spoke design, while the instrument cluster is visually appealing with a simple but race inspired four gauge design. The front seats are quite large, contoured for bigger people. Whether cloth or the leather upgrade, these seats are very comfortable to be in for hours at a time with adjustable lumbar support and power adjustments, just they do lack bolstering if you're doing aggressive cornering. The RT Road and Track Pack, as well as the SRT8, got dark slate gray bucket seats with bigger bolsters to keep you firmly in place. Although it does seat 5, one downside is the sloping roofline which can cut into the rear headroom. The legroom is enough, but the middle seat has a hump on the floor which is very restrictive for legroom. The SRT8 is different once again inside, as it gets carbon fiber trim, SRT logos on the seats, LED accent lighting, and those different bucket seats. Next are performance numbers and times. Most chargers were rear-wheel drive except for some SXT and Touring models where an all-wheel drive system was available. For 06 to 08, the all-wheel drive system is engaged all the time, routing roughly 60% of the power to the rear wheels and 40% of the power to the front wheels. Starting in 09, there was a Borg Warner torque on demand system used, which disconnects the front axles until extra traction is needed. The base models and some SE pluses came with a 2.7 liter V6 that was highly criticized for being too slow and unreliable. This gave you just 178 horsepower and 190 pound feet of torque, along with a 4 speed automatic. The next step up was the SXT, using a 3.5 liter V6 with 250 horsepower and 250 pound feet of torque with a 4 or 5 speed automatic. The RT got the 5.7 liter Hemi with 340 horsepower, 390 pound feet of torque, and a 5 speed automatic, but some versions did have a boost of 10 horsepower to 350. The Hemi got an upgrade in 2009, with one major difference being an upgrade to the cylinder heads, so it was bumped up to 368 to 372 horsepower and 395 pound feet of torque. 0 to 60 happens in the mid 5 second range, and the quarter mile in around 13.9 seconds. This engine also has a multi-displacement system, or MDS, which allows the engine to run on four cylinders when horsepower is not needed, like when cruising at highway speeds. The final V8 available is a 6.1 liter Hemi in the SRT8, which pumps out 425 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque, and that's also paired to a 5-speed automatic. The SRT8 sees a 0-60 to time in roughly 4.8 seconds, and a quarter mile run in 13.2 seconds. Dodge likes to release limited edition models, and there were plenty for this gen, like the 2006-2009 Daytona RT, 2007-2009 SRT8 Super B, and 2008 Dub Edition, all produced in limited quantities. The Charger was also sold to law enforcement agencies as a pursuit or police car. Now we move on to the second gen which was introduced in 2011. While it was redesigned and used an updated LD platform, it was still closely related to the original LX platform. Beginning with the trim levels, it's been fairly consistent, but new models have continued to be added. So the first couple years had SE, SXT, RT, and SRT8, while the all-wheel drive lived on for the SXT and RTs. Looking at 2013, the base started around 26,000, rising up to 30,000 for the RT, and over 45,000 for the premium SRT8. 2015 introduced some significant changes to the upper part of the lineup, with the Scat Pack, SRT392, and SRT Hellcat, with prices rising up to over 66,000 for the Hellcats. Fast forward to 2023 and it's mostly the same lineup, with the addition of wide bodies which were introduced in 2020, and the SRT Hellcat Red Eye in 2021 rising up to almost $90,000 for a Charger. The styling was revamped inside and out for 2011. The new Chargers featured new side scoops along the doors, a new fascia design, more angular headlights, and an even more aggressive grill style. Throwing it back to the concept and 1968 to 1970 models, the car had a wraparound racetrack style LED taillight that went around the entire trunk width. Dodge also improved driver visibility by over 15%, as this had been a complaint in the earlier gen with its steep windshield. 
The SRT8 returned as a 2012 model, and it got a blacked out crosshair grille and more muscular hood and front fascia design. It would also get its own special 20 inch wheels and four piston Brembos all the way around. 2015 saw a significant makeover. While the body shape would remain similar, retaining that Coke bottle styling, Dodge claims that they reworked almost every panel on the car, and the result is a leaner and more athletic look and feel while somehow keeping the same dimensions. The front grille is totally new, but it keeps that Dodge crosshair style, and rounded LED headlights were added. The racetrack taillight remained as well, but it got thinner and rounder. And Dodge would continue tweaking the look right until 2023. So at first, scat packs and SRT models got their own performance fascias and hoods, but in 2019, this look became available on all the models other than the base SXT. 2019 saw openings flanking both sides of the grille, but Dodge quickly and quietly got rid of that the following year. 2020 saw the addition of the wide body for the Scat Pack and the SRT Hellcat, adding 3.5 inch wider fender flares, a different fascia with a mail slot grille, wider 20 by 11 inch wheels, and some performance features like the Bilstein Adaptive Damping Suspension. Hoods, spoilers, wheels, and more visual aspects were continuously changed and updated, and the addition of the 2022 jailbreak models added even more options like different colored calipers and badging. The interiors also got an upgrade from the older feeling versions of the 2006-2010 models. A new Dodge badge was used on the steering wheel, which got a newer four-spoke design. The instrument panel had two bigger gauges flanking a digital information display, and this gauge cluster blended in smoothly with the center stack, which had different options like a 4.3 inch and 7 inch touchscreen. Again, for 2015, the interior was reworked and it included new materials for the door, console, and dash panels, a new steering wheel and seats, and a wide range of trim packages with various leather, Alcantara, and cloth seating. This interior also featured a new instrument cluster with a 7 inch display standard with a better screen than before, and there was the available 8.4 inch Uconnect touchscreen radio standard on many chargers with available navigation and Uconnect apps. Premium models like the Hellcats came with a 200 mile per hour speedometer, heated and ventilated front seats, and options like a 19 speaker Harman Kardon audio system, carbon fiber interior trim, and a suede headliner. For the final year in 2023, all the standard seats were downgraded to cloth, but there were Napa leather, Alcantara, and Laguna leather options available. Performance is up next. Again, there were all-wheel drive models, SXT and RT, until 2014, and that system automatically removed power to the front axle when not required, so it gave it a bit of an improvement in fuel economy. After 2014 though, the RT all-wheel drive was discontinued, and SXT and later GT models would be the only models to have all-wheel drive options. The SE, SXT, and GT came with a 3.6 liter Pentastar V6. This engine has 292 to 300 horsepower and 260 to 264 pound-feet of torque. This V6 is over a second faster than the previous 3.5 liter, with a 0-60 time of between 6.2 to 6.4 seconds, and the quarter mile in 14.7 seconds. The RT continued with the 5.7 Hemi, this time with 370 horsepower and 395 pound-feet of torque, again lasting the entire generation pretty much unchanged. The SRT8 and then later the SRT392 and the Scat Packs used the 6.4 liter Hemi V8 with 470 horsepower and torque from 2012 to 2014, and then 485 horsepower and 475 pound-feet of torque for 2015 to the present. Performance times for the 6.4 liter show a 0 to 60 time in 3.9 to 4.2 seconds and the quarter mile in 12.3 to 12.5 seconds stock. Note that the NAG1 5-speed Mercedes transmission continued to be used from 2012 to 2014, but beginning in 2012, many V6 models were equipped with the upgraded ZF 8-speed automatic transmission. The V8s would continue with the 5-speed and then the 8-speed transmission became standard on all models starting in 2015. The Hellcats added the 6.2 liter supercharged Hemi V8 with 707 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque, and that went up to 717 and 656 for 2021, thanks to some tuning and a change to the intake. The Hellcat is capable of a 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds and an 11.6 second quarter mile. The Red Eye was introduced in 2021, and that got the high output version of that engine. So it's still a 6.2 liter supercharged V8, but the supercharger increased from a 2.4 liter to a 2.7 liter, and overall there are many different components, like the air intake system, cylinder heads and camshaft, the block, rotating assembly, exhaust, cooling system, and more. The result is a sizable increase with 80 more horsepower up to 797, and 61 more pound-feet of torque up to 717. Due to the fact that it's hard to put all this power down thanks to the traction, Red Eye 0-60 to times are similar to the Hellcat, with 0-60 to around 3.5 seconds, and the quarter mile down to around 10.6 seconds stock. 
Just like the first gen, this generation saw so many different limited edition versions, like the Mopar 11, 2013 Daytona, SRT8 392 Appearance Package, 100th Anniversary Edition, SRT8 Super B, and more. The LX slash LD Chargers Legacy will live on for years and years to come. This was an immensely popular car, taking over social media and the aftermarket scene, and having fans across the world. It was also obtainable for most people, whether your budget was a used V6 or a brand new red eye. The sales figures also show this, as the Charger has sold over 1.4 million times in the US alone, not even including 2023. So obviously the sales didn't cause the cancellation of this car. Unfortunately, as they say, all good things come to an end. Dodge CEO Tim Kaniskas had been hinting towards electrification for several years and started dropping some huge quotes in early 2021. By November 2021, he confirmed that the Hellcat would only last through the end of 2023. In 2022, he confirmed this was, quote, the end of an era for sure, end quote. He also said, quote, these cars that you know today will go out of production by the time we get to 2024. The 23 model year, Chargers and Challengers will be the last of the Hemi-powered L cars that we build. When that window closes, there's no reopening it. Production ends December of 23. You need to get your orders in now or never. Because when the last Hemi Chargers and Challengers roll off the line at Brampton, it's going to be the end of a legendary era. End quote. That'll bring us to the next part of the video, looking at the reasoning for the cancellation and the flaws of the Charger, as we do for all the vehicles in this series. One of the major reasons why Dodge felt the need to discontinue these Chargers in their current form would be because they feel internal pressure from Stellantis to start shifting to electric, as well as external pressures from the market. Stellantis is investing over 30 billion euros by 2025 on electrification, and they have lofty goals to move in that direction, like for example having 50% of passenger car and light duty truck sales in the US to be battery electric vehicles by the end of the decade. Dodge was given some of this money and told to begin working on future performance EVs. In terms of the external pressures, these come in the form of compliance costs and environmental regulations, such as the Corporate Average Fuel Economy, or CAF, in the United States, where vehicles across a specific brand's lineup must reach a certain threshold each year with respect to miles per gallon. Dodge is unwilling to continue paying so many compliance fines, especially with bigger engines like the Hellcat engine or the 6.4 liter Hemi V8, and it has been getting harder and harder for Dodge to keep meeting CAF requirements with these engines as they get stricter each year. Most other auto manufacturers are also making some form of EVs, so Dodge doesn't want to be left behind, even though it might go against what their customers want. Another key factor here is that Dodge plans to supersede the Hemis with their new 3.0-liter twin-turbocharged Hurricane engines, something that we've already seen in the Jeep Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer. So this is kind of like a stepping stone to electric, and should be offered on the Challenger and possibly the Charger as well for the next gen. While the electric Banshee propulsion system probably will be the performance match for the Hellcats, the standard output and high output Hurricanes both have more power output than the 5.7 and 6.4 liter Hemis, and Dodge says they could have 15-25% to better fuel economy as well. I'll probably show the Jeep Hemi Hurricane comparison because we don't have the full Dodge specs yet. But for Dodge, it was a no-brainer to try to move forward with the Hurricanes, and to do so, they needed to move away from those L-body cars. Another massive factor of importance here is that Dodge believes that the EVs can continue to enhance their future performance more than the Hemi V8s. Dodge has said that every gain in horsepower resulted in a gain in market share as they continued to upgrade the performance of their Hemi V8 engines. Kuniskis has said that the Dodge engineers had reached a practical limit of the performance that they could achieve from those internal combustion engines, and they believe the electric motors can give them more. So Dodge views EVs as a natural evolution of the muscle car, and this evolution can provide more horsepower and better performance times. They want to try to chase down other manufacturers like Tesla, Rivian, and Lucid Motors with their own future EVs. So now we'll look at a few flaws and problems that really nitpick certain items that are related to the car. Now I've talked about this here and there over the years on the channel, but each engine kind of had their own flaws or detrimental problems. First, the 2.7 liter V6 was quite unreliable, as there were thousands that got a buildup of oil sludge, reducing the flow of oil through the engine and causing excess wear, or in many cases failure. It was also embarrassingly underpowered, as slow or slower than vehicles such as the Chevy Spark, Mini Cooper Convertible, Toyota Prius, and a V6 Mercedes Sprinter 2500.
The newer V6, the 3.6 liter Pentastar, had problems with the cylinder heads on 2011 to 2013 models, where they would fail on the left bank and cause serious engine damage. The Pentastar also had rocker tapping and ticking, with FCA issuing a service bulletin for that problem. This engine was manufactured using sand casting methods, so sometimes remaining deposits would cause cooling system components to break, like the water pump, radiator, heater core, and oil cooler failures. The pre-Eagle Hemi, so 2006-2008 in the Chargers, had the issue of premature drop valve seats, where the valve seats fall out of the head and cause serious damage to the engine. This was a design flaw that Chrysler fixed for the newer Hemis. As for the 2009 and up Hemis, these Eagle motors have ticking noises caused when the lifters are faulty and get stuck, and those stuck lifters can wear down the camshaft lobes, eating into the cam, eventually requiring a new lifter and camshaft. The 6.4 liter Hemis also suffered from this issue to some degree. One of the notoriously bad spots for reliability would be the suspension, especially in the front. This was marginally improved in 2011 with an updated design, but due to the heavy curb weight of over 4,000 pounds, many owners find that suspension parts wear out far quicker than on other vehicles. This would include inner and outer tie rods, ball joints, sway bars, control arms, bushings, and more, causing squeaks, rattles, clunks, and other noises, loose steering, and a rougher and more unpredictable ride. It's a combination of the part quality and the design and heavy weight of the car, but it is something to watch out for. So that's the end of this video guys, thanks for watching and hopefully you enjoyed it. It was definitely a loaded topic, but I tried my best to give you guys as much information as I possibly could. What do you think about the Charger? Do you think this generation was a little long in the tooth, or did it have more life left? And are you excited for the next version that supersedes the LX slash LD? Let me know in the comments section below. Make sure to like and subscribe for more Mopar content, and I'll see you in the next video.